Hello and welcome everyone here at the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin to our event on hate speech and digital violence. My name is Veran Meyer. I'm head of the digital policy, policy division at the Heinrich Böll Foundation. We are an agency for green projects and ideas and our primary task is uh, political education in Germany and abroad. Therefore, we have a network of uh, 34 offices worldwide and uh, project partners in over 60 countries. Um, we put a particular emphasis in our work on gender democracy and this is why we've been following this event on the Facebook files very closely as well as the debate on platform regulation. We are therefore very happy to and delighted to welcome Francis Haugen here at the Heinrich Böll Foundation to discuss with us gender violence, hate speech and gender disinformation as well as platform accountability. We are also very happy to welcome Alexandra Gese. She is a Green MEP, um, and uh, Ann-Kathrin Müller, journalist at The Spiegel, as well as our moderator, Annalena von Hodenberg, director at the organization HateAid. We're very happy to have you all here and are looking forward to the debate. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over to you, Annalena, to guide us through the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Verana, and um, yeah, welcome to our discussion today to everyone. We want to talk about misinformation, about digital violence, platform accountability today, and we want to do that especially, um, want to talk about digital violence against women and young girls, and we want to do this especially in the light of um, the revelations that our first and special guest has brought us um, in the last couple of months with the Facebook files. And Francis Hogan, this could not come at a more crucial point in time for us here in Europe because in Brussels right now, the Digital Services Act is being negotiated. And this is basically the law that is going to decide uh, what kind of rights users are going to have and what kind of you know, regulations we are going to put on the platform. So I think European lawmakers are watching closely. And so, yeah, let's dive right in. Francis Hogan, it seems you are on everyone's lips right now. You um, have been to the US Congress, to the UK Parliament, you have talked to lawmakers now um, from the new coalition uh, today here in Berlin, and all this because you know things that all of us that are using Facebook um, and other social media do not know, and you decided to share these insights um, with us. Um, just to introduce you quickly, um, you worked three years for Facebook from 2018 to 2021 and you were a leading product manager in the so-called civic misinformation section until you decided to leave the company and blow the whistle on Facebook um, and on how Facebook is dealing or not dealing with digital violence, misinformation and other harmful uh, effects on their users. I must say, as a director for a consultation for victims of digital violence, um, I thought I would not be, but I was surprised and shocked by what I read in the Facebook files. So, Francis, what was the most shocking to you, actually, and maybe also the tipping point to say, okay, I need to act? So when I joined Facebook, um, I already was aware of the profound human costs of misinformation. I'd had a very, very close friend that had been instrumental in my recovery when I was relearning to walk, um, get radicalized in 2016 from misinformation on the internet. So when I joined, I already had a lens that I think was a little bit different than many other Facebook employees. There's a culture at Facebook that focuses on the positive. That is a natural human trait, that we like to see good news and we don't like to see bad news. At the same time, when I joined, uh, I became aware of how severe the problem was in places outside the United States. So my job as the civic misinformation PM, instead of just the viral misinformation PM, was to focus on areas that didn't have third-party fact-checking, or were in times of crisis where third-party fact-checking couldn't move fast enough to keep up with the, with the situation. That put front and center for me what was happening in places in the global south, in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, how Facebook's underinvestment in solutions that can work in a linguistically diverse way in a world where not everyone speaks English, um, that because they'd underinvested in those things, they were really setting the stage for what, was, what I saw was going to be a very, very scary next decade or two decades. And since I joined, so I joined in, in the summer of 2019, 
I didn't know that Ethiopia was going to flare up, right? Uh, I, I knew that Myanmar had happened, that there had been a, 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 mass, a mass killing event as a result of, uh, that was fanned by social media. But I had no idea that we were about to see chapter after chapter unfold. And I genuinely believe that if we don't take significant actions, uh, we will see this is only the opening chapters to a dystopian novel. So you were saying um, one of your most like, important messages is there's something that we also thought, but that is so that you are saying so clearly is that Facebook is putting profit over people. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that to us and kind of dive us through this face, how Facebook works in a sense? Sure. So Facebook's business model is very simple. They want to keep you on the site as long as possible. Uh, they like to remind us they don't goal on time spent but they make their money based on how much time you spend. Right? The longer you spend on Facebook, the more ads you see, the more money they make. Facebook has a challenge, which is in many parts of the world, they are dependent on amplification systems to make sure they get enough content to keep you on the site as long as they want to keep you on the site. That means they prioritize reshares much, much more than perhaps they should. Um, or they, they don't do very simple measures like, you know, on Twitter, you have to click on a link in order to reshare it. It sounds like a really small thing, but just forcing people to pause for a moment actually makes much less misinformation get spread. But Facebook has chosen not to do these things because they eat away at little slices of profit. You know, we're talking 0.1, 0.2% here each time. Facebook right now is making decisions from the perspective of just its shareholders. And we need to create a countermass, you know, pull it away more towards what's in the public good. And we can do that things like through the DSA. So um, you state and um, the leaked internal documents show, um, ah, sorry, um, a new European-wide survey that came out today um, that uh, Hate Aid and the digital Landica Digital Justice Movement have published shows alarming data if we look at the situation of young girls and women on social media. We see that in Europe, um, girls and young women between 18 and 35, 50% of them have already been victims of digital violence online. And we also see in the survey that this is having an effect. 52% of the women in Europe are already not daring to say their opinion oftentimes anymore online because they are afraid of this kind of digital violence, that this was happened to them, could happen to them again. How does the current algorithm enforce hate against women and content that is violent? Facebook's own documents document that there is something called the civic participation gap, where you see that women participate significantly less online, especially in civic matters, um, partially because of things like they are exposed to more violence. There are very senior politicians throughout, throughout Europe who, have, um, who are women who have decided not to run in the future because they have said, I get so harassed online or I get threatened online. One of the things that I think people aren't aware of is that Facebook's algorithms uh, concentrate and hyper amplify bad behavior. So it could be eating disorder content, it could be hate speech, it could be violence against women. Facebook is always its algorithms. So they remember, they didn't design it to do this. This is a side effect. Because they are prioritizing what content can elicit a reaction from you, the algorithms are always searching for what is the rabbit hole they can lure you down. What are your vulnerabilities? And for some people, those vulnerabilities are things like misogyny. And so you end up having these echo chambers where people reinforce things like, oh, that woman politician is bad. And you end up in a situation where it's, where because these dialogues are isolated, voices that might pull them away from that center of mass don't exist. You know, they, they are not part of that conversation. Another thing people aren't aware of is that a very small number of serial offenders make up a huge amount of the violence against women online. That people will go and you know, threaten, they'll uh, insult, they'll do other kinds of online violence, and they'll do it over and over again. And part of why it's important for companies like Facebook to staff enough uh, people looking at complaints and to take those complaints seriously is if we don't, those people will be able to do substantially more harm before they're stopped. Since when does Facebook know about this? I don't know the exact date. I know for the civic participation gap, it's been at least a year, um, maybe two years. Um, but I don't know for the other things. The Facebook files 
revealed also, which I found really also shocking, that its rules don't apply to everyone in the same way. So there are people who have certain privileges, online Facebook VIPs, I would call them, um, like, for example, the soccer player Neymar, who posted an intimate image of a woman um, that caused a wave of digital violence against her and was freely available for more than a day, attracting more than 56 million views. That means it's as many as two-thirds of the German population. Um, can you explain how this VIP mechanism works and what are the consequences? Facebook has a policy against non-consensual naked imagery. So this is people doing retaliatory nudes, for example. Uh, Neymar, uh, in an effort to discredit a woman who had accused him of, of, of harming her, uh, went and held up his phone on a live broadcast uh, that went out to many, many of his followers and was later, because it was kept on the platform, was seen by a huge number of people. He showed those images to the camera and uh, it led to extreme violence against her in real life too. Um, that program is called Crosscheck and it was put in place because Facebook was tired of having fire drills when you know, its rules were actually enforced against celebrities and people with influence. And so because Facebook wasn't willing to invest enough, so this is again profits over people, because they weren't willing to invest enough in either staffing those policy teams or invest enough to make sure that that content actually got a second check, right? One of the things that we found, or like I found as I read through things, was um, Facebook has many, many separate integrity systems. And many of those systems, because they were unwilling to staff people on them, they just literally whitelisted those people. They never got a second check. And so in the case of something like this incident, Facebook should have spent enough human resources to make sure that that content, even if it, even if it qualified for a second check, that it actually got a second check fast. Because when you don't act fast enough, justice de delayed is justice denied. That woman was materially harmed because of Facebook's underinvestment. Is there also like fear that these people, these celebrities could leave Facebook and then this whole traffic would be, would be lost? I think it's less a question of them leaving Facebook and more that they're worried that they'll make Facebook look bad, right? Um, or it's a thing of, you know, Facebook systems have errors in them. You know, the uh, internal estimates are like 10% 10, 10 of the time that they take something down, it's an error. And so the thing that they're afraid of is that, you know, maybe something that shouldn't have been taken down will get taken down. And then that, face, that celebrity will draw attention to the fact that Facebook hasn't invested enough. So then they would rather leave the violence online than yeah. risk that this um, celebrity would uh, complain about that. Yes. We know through your revelation that Facebook is fully aware of these problems. And this is, for me, like the most shock shocking thing. And in the past, the company has repeatedly assured us in so many meetings, um, in public debates, that it is doing everything it can. It has to be become be better, but it's doing everything it can to keep especially women, young girls, safe and take down illegal and violent content. From your insights, is Facebook doing really everything it can? Unquestionably, Facebook is not doing everything they can. Remember, Facebook is on, on, set, on track to make something on the order of $45 billion in the next 12 months. Easily, they could invest another billion, another five billion. Like, how profitable do they really need to be? They have some of the largest profit margins in the world for a large company. Um, and yet, they choose not to invest more in either making the systems for catching that violence better, um, or in making sure that complaints about these kinds of things are immediately responded to. I also want to draw attention to the fact that women who, who don't speak English are under much, much greater jeopardy than women who do speak English, right? Facebook consistently funds much more resources for English speakers than for non-English speakers. And for many people in the world, these are people who speak languages that maybe have 20, 30 million speakers. They might have just the most minimal of skeleton crews supporting those comments. And so some of the most marginalized women, women who may be in fragile situations, get the least amount of support. Let's, we, could we say that we have a double VIP system where we have the mm. whitelisted celebrities and also the English speaking people who are also, yeah, yeah, also on a VIP list against everyone else? Facebook is aware that they, uh, the, the, the jurisdiction that has the most potential power over them is the United States. And so they, invest more in safety systems for English speakers. I really hope that Europe takes a stand with things like the Digital Services Act to ensure that there's at a minimum more transparency because then people can make informed choices on whether or not they want to use these platforms. 
and to make sure that Facebook actually provides safety systems for people who don't speak English languages. Francis, thank you very much. I want to open the panel and um, to our other guests, and I'm delighted to welcome Anne Katrin Müller who is a journalist for the Spiegel magazine and who has reported on far rights movements and parties, as well as digital violence against women. Um, welcome to our panel. And um, anne Katrin, I need to ask you as well, what surprised you the most in the Facebook files? Well, of course, it was interesting that they knew about the, I mean, how could they not know in, on the one hand, but on the other, it's still shocking that they even show their own employees and that still not enough is being done. Uh, and also I found really interesting because it it's not only about the women only uh, who are being targeted, but also about the whole society, uh, what they know about Instagram doing to um, teenage minds, uh, especially girls' minds, uh, in how they view themselves. Uh, I think that is really shocking. Katrin Müller, you have repeatedly covered hate and disinformation online in your reporting. You have talked to victims of digital violence. You've especially covered the situation of women. What is the most haunting about the situations they find themselves in on these platforms? Well, there's several things, but if I had to pick the most haunting, of course, it's really shocking if a woman uh, or girl has to think about what they have to say, because in the end, the consequence might be that they have to move, because they really fear for their lives. Uh, and I've had people that I talked to that had this uh, kind of problem and um, I mean it's not every case is not like this of course but still if I know politicians that are really good female politicians that think whether they want to go in the first line of politics because they s say okay I've got small kids should I really do this it's harrying enough as it is um, I know of normal people not politicians um, that uh, have to fear for their life because they speak openly openly in social networks or that tweet um, powerfully uh, and that they have like either a huge audience or even a small one and that are being harassed online. I know of women, especially if they have um, migration background, um, that are being attacked even more than white women. Um, and it's really the way we want to live in our society that is being discussed on this kind of platforms. And because not enough is being done, the, it gets worse and worse because every day you see hate online and maybe even rape suggestions or death threats. Um, every day you think more, okay, this is normal. So if that is normal, then do I want to be part of this? Do I really say what I want to say? And then it kind of grows and grows and grows. And the problem is not new, but not enough is being done to stop it. Um, and that is, and I mean, it even changed the German elections, in my opinion. It changed the election campaigns, at least. And it changed how we viewed people and how we looked at it. So it's a huge problem. So when I, when I listen to what you're just saying, I'm thinking, okay, in the last hundred years, women have fought to get into these positions. They have fought to get into the first line in politics, first line in, in journalism. And now we are at a point where through social media, what you have been, uh, you've described, they are kind of, you know, pushed back into like the second line or the third line. Who is also behind this? Are there certain groups? Are there certain, um, in, also who is harassing women? And is this just something that is random or is it also something that is orchestrated? Um, it is orchestra orchestrated, not in the sense that there's like one man at the top that says, okay, now we have to stop these women. But of course, what you say belongs together. Because women are being more and more powerful, more and more outspoken, uh, more and more uh, out in the public, um, there is more backlash. Um, and what we see here, and Facebook and other social networks are being used for this, is a kind of global war on women in some sense. Um, and I mean, even in Texas, which as far as I know, is not the most left <laughs> state in the US, um, there's uh, security people or even um, a, a department that has a list on uh, terrorist attacks against women. So there is a form of um, terror attacks on women, which derives the hate that comes, that leads to this kind of attacks comes from, it starts small, right? Like words can turn into something. So every day we see hate online directed, especially at women, and it is different hate 
directed towards men. I mean, if there's something against a woman, it's always about their bodies, them being a woman. Uh, it's not just death threats or, I don't know, if, if I write an article that some maybe right-wing people don't like, <laughs> we'll talk about the ideology later maybe, um, then my colleagues may, and we are more than one authors under the piece, uh, so my colleagues don't normally get as many emails, if any at all, and they get like, oh, shitty piece, and I get, you bitch, you should be raped, you know? So you can see even in like everyday um, moments that there is a difference. And um, I think if we say this is a global problem and we say that even in Germany, in the US, we can feel it, that it has consequences, and not only in places where it's even harder for women, Myanmar and whatever, um, then we have to do something about it. And uh, I think more regulation for a company that earns as much money, um, is it's time to do that. And the other question you asked, I think what's behind this is that all kinds of different um, ideologies can meet in one thing. So racists, uh, right-wing people, Islamists, um, I don't know, probably forgetting s someone, <laughs> they, they, they all agree on that they don't like women that much or that they don't like outspoken women that much. So they can meet online and it happens in, for example, the incel community uh, that they, they have the same one goal. They have very different views on lots of other topics, but they have one goal when they look at women. And that is that women are not worthy of being able to speak openly in public. Angela, would you say that these groups know about how what Francis just told us, how the algorithms work, and do they really kind of do they know how they can benefit from you know from how the algorithms works and penetrate them? Maybe it's also something that you can you can also comment on. I think maybe they didn't know in the beginning. Now they should know because I mean we write about it and we talk about it. Um, but even in the beginning, they must have felt that it's pretty easy for them to use the algorithms. They got pretty successful uh, successful pretty quickly. So even if they didn't know, they just said what they think, and then they suddenly found others who thought like them, and they saw they can do this without being harmed, right? It's not like the police is knocking on their door as soon as they write that a woman should be raped and it's online for five days. So you do it again, because what's the harm, right? And that's how the circle kind of uh, continues. But maybe you want to... Add something. Uh, and Facebook knows that a very small fraction of bad behavior is reported. So if the way they train their algorithms, uh, like the, the, the integrity systems, uh, doesn't catch the bad content, the likelihood that that content will then be reported can be very, very low. Right? Victims get tired of reporting it, especially when it doesn't get acted on. When it goes into echo chambers, so the algorithm is always trying to figure out what rabbit hole can it lure you down. And these communities begin to form norms where if someone did step up and defend women, they would get shot down, right? Or they might get kicked out of a group. Groups have also learned that, you know, if you invite someone to a group for 30 days, Facebook will insert that content into their newsfeed. And if they engage with any of it, then they'll consider that a follow. And you see things like for, for movements like QAnon, where people will go and invite tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. A single person inv invited 300,000 people to QAnon groups, right? Um, and all those people get invited. You can now inject content into their feeds. And so it's not just a thing of people even seeking out this content. It's that people have realized how they can build movements for sometimes very antisocial ends very easily with these platforms. Alexandra Geese, I would like to, to turn to you now. You are a member of the European Parliament. You are a leading voice in European debates on digitalization and women's rights. Welcome. Um, and you are right now there in Brussels um, and have been for quite some time negotiating the Digital Services Act. You are there um, in the European Parliament on behalf of the Greens. And this law is an attempt to regulate social media platforms European-wide. After all, we have heard from the Facebook files and the revelations and insights that Francis Hogan has given us today and also said, you know, this, it's really time to act. How has that changed your perspective on what needs to be done now in the Digital Services Act? I think it has 
confirmed the direction where I was trying to steer the debate. Because when I started working on the Digital Services Act and on platform regulation, um, the community working on that spoke a lot about liability, what in the US would be Section 230, and we have similar norms here, and then about how to, to combat legal content, like notices, how to get Facebook to react to, to take down content. And I always thought we need to address the systemic issues. So it's not focusing on a single piece of content, but on figuring out how it can happen that exactly that kind of hateful content, that disinformation, all kinds of polarizing content gets, gets disseminated so quickly to so many people. And therefore, I'm so incredibly grateful to Francis Hogan, who has brought the document and has explained, well, it's because Facebook does exactly that, because we were all observing it. But when you set it out publicly, everybody said, well, you don't know that. It's because people are more interesting in that kind of polarizing content, which to some extent is true, because to come back to the, the, the gender violence discussion, very often, gender disinformation, for example, which is another big issue, which I think has been a really big issue in our electoral campaign here in Germany, um, it confirms the bias people already have. They are, you know, we're all educated to, to believe more that maybe a woman might not be competent rather than a man, because it confirms what is already in our heads, and this is why it's so successful. successful. And then it is amplified by the Facebook, Facebook algorithmic systems that, that amplify that kind of content. And so what we are trying to do in Brussels, and the Commission has to some extent done that as well, as understood that as well, the European Commission, is to look under the hood, to look at what is actually happening in those systems. And this is why we're fighting so much for a very s strong rules on transparency, giving access to scientists, giving access to some parts of civil society, but also to some kinds of authorities to perform investigations to find out what is what's going on. Um, having companies do their risk assessment, but looking for independent audits on those risk assessments, because I don't think we can trust Facebook to explain what harms they are causing <laughs> and why that is. Um, I think we need um, an independent authority to look into the results of all these investigations when we have access to the data and to the systems, and this is the way we should be going. Another talking point of mine, and this has become a little bit of focus of the debate in, in Brussels as well, is the issue of these companies controlling huge amounts of personal data, which allows them to send every one of us exactly the kind of content that will confirm our personal bias, so we are likely to believe it, and then take us little by little a step further into radicalization, so down the rabbit hole, as Francis has been saying. So I think those companies shouldn't be allowed to collect all these enormous amounts of data. So Facebook shouldn't know people's religion and sexual orientations and, and infer further conclusions from that, but only the data that we conf confer voluntarily to Facebook. And this is, this is another thing we are, we are discussing, and I hope we, we will have a success. I think the DSA is a great opportunity, can really be a game changer globally, because many countries in the world are, are looking at us, are asking us, what, what are you doing, and we are looking at you in Europe with so much hope. But if it's not um, ambitious at na enough, it could also be a big disappointment because if it lacks the ambition, people will say, oh, in Europe, you try to regulate platforms and you have seen that it's not possible. So I think we need to really to be ambitious. Francis Hogan, what, uh, what, what do you think of that from your insights? Do you think this kind of leg legislation is the right direction? Would that make a change? I'm a strong proponent for principles-based approaches, and I'm a strong proponent of risk assessments, but they need to be risk assessments that have teeth. And I've, I've been promoting an idea that I call the one, two, three plan, which is Facebook can do the first pass. They can identify what they believe are the dangers of their system, but the community should also get to have a voice, because the reality is Facebook is not very diverse. They don't have, they live in a very, relatively few number of offices, and they just don't see what the general experience is of those platforms. It's really hard to, to be creative enough to imagine what could be harms when you don't live them yourself. 
So the community needs to be involved, and those need to be treated as equal concerns to what is flagged by Facebook. And then the last thing is Facebook must articulate what it's going to do to fix those things. Because Facebook has figured out a playbook to get away with doing nothing, which is they always say, we're so sorry this happened. It's really hard. We're going to do our best to fix it. But they never actually tell us how they're going to fix it. They never give us a five-point plan. And I think all these things need to be stitched together with data, that we need to be able to have enough data to understand, is Facebook actually doing what it says it's doing? Are they actually making progress on that five-point plan they gave us? Because as long as the incentives don't change, Facebook's behavior will not change. Thank you, Müller. You, let's go to the concrete. Ne? You have talked uh, to women, to young girls who have been victims of digital violence. What would be their urgent needs? What should be addressed for them? I think what they really need is, uh, on the one hand, that platforms delete more quickly and uh, keep their personal data safe. Um, and the other thing is more uh, societal approach. I mean, we as a society need to stand up and say, we don't want this kind of um, debate <laughs> or talk online um, and hate online. And we don't want it to be able to spread this far. And there's always some kind of scandal if there's like one case where they say, oh, this is crazy, this shouldn't happen. But it's it's not like one case scenario once a year. It's It's happening all the time. Um, uh, to different uh, kinds of uh, women uh, and different positions. Uh, so what they really need is for politicians to feel um, like they sh should and could do something. I mean, for years, the discussion was more like, okay, we can't really do something. What should we do? Like, there was not even an idea that they could do something. It's just a company. The company can do what they want, and people give their data freely. Well, yes and no. We give some data freely, but they add it to other data that we didn't give them, but maybe our friends gave to them. But it was not, not our decisions, but they add it up, and they can, you know, um, add some more by their own doing uh, after years of having this kind of platform. And so I think what the women really want is to not be told, oh, you know, it's not that hard, it's not that dangerous, you know, don't be, um, I don't know, bitchy. Um, but that we understand that there is a problem and that politicians um, say, okay, let's, let's see what we can do. Um, and that uh, Facebook, actually, that they only do what they say they do. I mean, that would be enough, right? If, if they adhere to what their own standards are, if what they r write down on their own page, if they would do that, that would help so much. And I've been to the campus, um, and I mean, every wall is kind of LGBTIQ community, equal rights for everyone, and you know, like we're such a modern company. And then when you look at it, I mean, who has profited the most from Facebook? Donald Trump, <laughs> and people like him. So it's not doing what they say they do. And that, that would be enough if they, if they finally did that. Alexandra Giza, how can we enforce this? How can we enforce that, uh, also with the digital services sector maybe, um, that Facebook is really doing what they say they are doing? So it, that's simple, it sounds, but it is not that simple. I think two things. Um, one is having access to the data and to the systems and making known how this works in order to give different kinds of organizations, organizations that focus maybe on racial discrimination rather than on gender violence or on, on discrimination against women or in other aspects, that they have the possibility to gain the knowledge they need and to bring up to their issues to legislator or to um, and to an independent agency at European level. I think we need to have European enforcement because many countries in Europe, I mean, even Germany is not big enough to stand up against Facebook or other platforms. You know, it's not only Facebook actually. Um, so I think it should be a, a European level and we need some kind of, of course, center of competence where we really have the best specialists in the world who are able to analyze that data, who know exactly where to look and who cannot be lied to. Because I think one, you asked before the question, what was so shocking about Facebook? And I think one of the shocking things was the fact that Facebook has systematically lied to Congress, to, uh, to the European Parliament. You know, they just say one thing and they do something completely different. So we need people that are really competent, that really have power to enforce the Digital Services Act, and who know where to look and who are listened to. Actually, this leads me to my next question, because um, if 
Francis Hogan hadn't blown the whistle, whistle, we wouldn't even know about all these details and could kind of, you know, really precisely act right now. So Francis, um, we hear all this from you, thankfully now, but um, Facebook has been for a long time a closed shop. Um, it seems Facebook is afraid of transparency. Why is that? I think there's a real pattern where if you begin in a transparent way, it's easy to continue in a transparent way. It is much harder to not be transparent and accumulate all the little cruft, right? Like, you know, you don't maybe clean the corners quite as well as you could because, you know, no one's looking. And it, so you become more and more afraid of transparency because you're worried what people will find. And I think a thing that a lot of people don't understand is that Facebook is actually substantially less transparent than either Google or Twitter. Right? In the case of Google, Google knows people can download their search results and analyze them. And as a result, because they know academics are writing papers about it, they actually staff full-time engineers who write code and work on search to write blog posts explaining how search works for more people. Twitter knows one-tenth of all the tweets that get written go out in their fire hose. And because of that, they make more responsible decisions. Also, many of the information operations on Facebook get caught on Twitter's, on Twitter's data, which is crazy. Like, they map them over. I think it's one of those things where my, my greatest hope of, my dis of this disclosure is that it is a big enough moment that it gives Facebook an opportunity to take a step back and say, we want to reset. We're, re we're ready to come clean. We're ready to do something different. Because I don't think they could have even done that if they hadn't had a moment like this, right? It would have been, again, would have been against their shareholders' interest. But now they have a chance to start over, hopefully. Hopefully, because um, just before the German elections, or during the German elections, they shut down the access for scientists from, for example, Algorithm Watch, from the yeah. New York University. So it was really like... Um, Isn't shocking? Yeah, it was really shocking. So yeah, let's see um, how they're going to deal with that and how shareholders also are going mm -hmm. to react to that. Um, for, for context, for those who aren't aware, um, there were researchers at NYU who had an, an open source plugin, so everyone could see how the code worked. Um, and they had volunteers who said, hey, you can see my, my ads so you can understand how political advertisements are used to influence elections. And Facebook was so offended by this act of transparency that they didn't just sue them, they also deleted their Facebook accounts. So they deleted their kids' baby photos because they were so offended by transparency. It's shocking. Yeah, it is really shocking. Um, Ms. Miller, from a journalist perspective, why is transparency of the social network so important and who should get the access to company insights? I mean, for journalists, it's always good to have transparency so we can see what we write about. Um, I mean, generally, I think I would even understand why Facebook, when it started, wasn't very transparent because it was a very competitive market and they all wanted to be the first big social network. So I, I get that. And then they rose to fame really quickly. And then that should have been the point to, to see, okay, we have created something so big that is so influential in so many countries and in so many debates and in so many parts of our lives that we, you know, we need to do what we say and, you know, show what we do. Um, and as you said, other networks are better. They're not maybe even good, but they're better. And um, they have changed over the last couple of years. So, um, I mean, of course, transparency would be the way to go. I don't think, we haven't talked about this, but deep platforming is, is another way to go to, to remove hateful content or um, harmful content. Um, it's a, a thing that we, a tool that we need to look at very carefully because it could lead to, you know, too much content being removed. So, okay. Platforming it, is. For example, maybe German viewers might know this. Um, Ken Jebsen, for example, during the Corona pandemic, is a conspiracy ideologist who um, was very big and who was on YouTube and Facebook and all the platforms. And at some point, he was so harmful to. What, what he was saying was so harmful to everyone, basically, who listened to him, that they removed his content from the big platforms. And since then, he's lost a lot of viewers, so he can't do as much harm anymore. And this has happened to other things, right-wing extremists and others. Um, 
but they're doing this very late and they're doing it mostly for PR reasons, I would say. For example, just shortly before the elections, they took down some querdenken accounts, which is our corona, um, yeah. Conspiracy. Conspiracy ideologists, and, um, but they did it very um, weirdly. They took down some accounts, they didn't take down others. Um, we wrote about this as well. Um, and so it's, it's really, yeah, it's, it's really important to get more transparency and to, to just be able to watch what they do. And then they can still do what they want to do, but we know about it and we can inform about it. So that, that would be even a milestone. Uh, and to see, I mean, th what I always think is about the algorithms. I mean, they use them to find out so much information about each and every one of us to give us the best ads. But they can't use the same technology to find out where the dick pics are and where the uh, swastikas are, I don't see it. It's like, how does that work? Why is the technology there for one thing but not for the other? So if they would just reallocate uh, the people and the algorithms to that kind of thing, then that would be so helpful. Princess <laughs> yes. Hogan, can you please tell us that they can use it for this as well? Because yeah. they always say they can't and um, so now we have you here. <laughs> Oh, so this was brought up um, in my UK Parliament testimony. So someone, uh, da uh, Damien, the guy who was running the panel, was responsible. I, I wish I knew his last name, but I don't remember. I feel so bad. Um, he brought this question, which is, he's like, they have a lookalike system for ads where they can find a lookalike audience. You know, if you have a thousand people who bought the shoe, we can find you other people like those people who would want to buy more of your shoes. Right? They have this system. It's very good. It's one of the most lucrative ways to make money on the internet. Uh, and yet, they've never said, hey, we, we have these people who volunteered, like they're people who have been, um, uh, who, have, who have reached out for help on, for example, child issues, right? They, are, they have uh, behaviors like child predatory issues. They volunteered to be a light to help you find other people who need help. They could do that, and they've chosen not to. Or in the case of abusers, if you found a thousand people who were abusing women, you should be able to get a very concentrated set of people who are also likely to be doing these behaviors. And it doesn't mean you have to automatically action them, but maybe it means that you should pay a little bit more attention when reports come in about them. These are all things that can be done. And what I was so shocked about the meta announcement was if we had had 10,000 more engineers working on safety, I guarantee you not as many women would be abused on the platform. But instead, Facebook, Facebook can find 10,000 engineers to build video games. It's just shocking. Alexandra, Gisse, what did you think about the meta announcement, actually? Um, that at a point where it, seemed, it seemed, seemed so absurd, at a point where the company was in, in such a big crisis, actually, that they would kind of, um, yeah, kind of just change the name and say, this is the future that we are building now, and we are looking at the present, and that is already so worrying. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you make of that? Well, I think it's a strategy to distract people from what is going on right now. I think it's it's exactly the same tactic that that Francis mentioned before. When you say, "Oh, oh you, you mean you messed up there," you, what do you say? You say, "Sorry, we'll do better next time." And I think this is sort of what they are saying. Say, "Well, yeah, Francis is doing the world speaking, but but we are not those people anymore. We are doing something else." I think that's the strategy. And it's even more worrying because they're not taking responsibility. They're not saying, OK, we are accountable. Let's talk about it. Let's see what we can do. But they just move on to something else, which is definitely going to be worse. I mean, we all know that if you don't learn from a mistake you make, from an experience you make, the next time it's going to be bigger and worse. Francis, let's talk about the Facebook users about maybe you, I don't know, but me, um, and a lot of the people watching here um, and seeing us today. How does, I always ask myself, how does Facebook see, Facebook see us? Um, what kind of rights do we have on the platform? And who are we to the company? So Facebook is full of kind, conscientious, caring people who genuinely want to connect the world. I think they view their users with a lot of um, care and concern. The problem is that when they are allocating their attention, the incentives inside the company encourage expansion and growth over necessarily making sure that things are actually um, locked down, right? And one of the consequences of that is that people just don't notice when the bad things happen or those things don't get, the, the right hand doesn't talk to the left hand. 
I think there are many, many people inside the company that would love to build more robust safety systems. They would love to be able to find the people abusing women on the platform. But right now, because of the incentives are that as they are, those people don't have the space to act. And things like the DSA and things like risk assessments can provide a counterweight to give space to those good actors inside of Facebook to actually do the work necessary to keep us all safe. Um, what do you guys think? What kind of rights should we have online? What kind of rights should we as users, what should we be to the company? Hmm. <laughs> I think, I mean, if, if you make yourself an account because you want to be in touch with your school friends or your colleagues or you just want to know about other people's lives without having to phone them, then um, you should, um, obviously, you tell Facebook who are your friends or your colleagues or whatever, so who do you know? So you give away quite a few of your information and you do it willingly. Um, so, of course, Facebook has the right to store that data. The question is, uh, for me, it's are they allowed to add all the context information with mine to build a more, you know, to build a bigger profile that I'm willing to give to them? Um, I mean, if you read all the long, long sentences that you agree to when you, when you do your uh, profile, then uh, you actually do this, so they're in the right to do what they do. Um, but the question is, if they now know, after all these years, what the information is being used to by others. I mean, it's not only them using it to give us better ads or to find uh, more information for companies, it's also other people using the information against me or you or you or you. So then they should be at least transparent about what they do it and how other others can find the information so that you can prepare yourself, basically. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, if I sign a contract, which basically terms and conditions are, I would expect Facebook to abide by its own rules, which they don't. That's the first thing. Second thing, um, exactly like Anne Katrin Müller said, I mean, I'm aware that I give my data if I, I post a picture or I write something, and it's fine for me that Facebook knows that about me. But I don't want them to collect any more data about me. I don't want them to infer anything uh, about me um, according to who my friends are or what kind of content I look at. I mean, I'm willing to tick a series of boxes what I'm interested in, but then I want my feed to look like that and not you know, to have what Facebook thinks is going to make me angry. That, that's basically it, I want my privacy uh, protected, even even if I'm on Facebook, if I choose to connect to my friends or to people who you know have the same political interests. So Facebook is an important interest in, uh, instrument for uh, for political work as well to to communicate. But I don't want them to go beyond. I want them to have the information that I'm willing to release and not to collect other information in a sneaky way and make money on that. I mean, you can still make money in a lot of different ways, like contextual advertising. If I go on Facebook and I want to look at cat pictures and you show me ads on cat food, I'm perfectly fine. But they don't need to build a profile with thousands or millions of data points about me and sell who I am to advertisers. That's not acceptable. Alexandra Gizzi, you said something. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yes. And maybe to be a bit, a bit more political, I mean, what they do is if you are interested in some content, they always show you content that is more radical in some way. So uh, if you go on a page that is, I don't know, about, a f about food generally and you look at cake more than the others, they show you more cake. Okay, fine. Yeah. But if they, if you start about being critical, maybe or unsure about vaccinations, and two days later you're like in the midst mm -hmm. of um, I don't know Corona uh, conspiracy theories, and QAnon in the end, then that is a real problem. That they always give you more than you you went for because they think they keep you there longer. It's what you said in the beginning. I think that is the real problem. I don't even care that much about how what kind of ads they show me. I care about them taking our data, thinking, oh, she might vote for this guy, and, you know, but maybe we want her to vote for that guy and pushing her in that direction, or this kind of, um, you know, usage of the data and our clicks. And um, I think that is the more, I mean, there was this really great podcast from the New York Times, I think, The Rabbit Hole, 
Um, and if you, if you follow you know, one person's journey into that rabbit hole and you see how it works and you see that it's working all over the world um, and even with people uh, here that would have never demonstrated before but then they you know, spend too much time online and suddenly they're here shouting that uh, Merkel should be dying or whatever, then that, that is a huge problem. Yeah but it's because they have the data that they exactly know where to start. You know, they exactly know um, that for me, it's making no sense to show me something about, you know, anti-refugees or something, mm. but it would never work for me. But maybe, you know, natural medicine, it's the kind that, you know, people of my generation might be interested in, green voters and so on. I mean, how many see have people have we seen that, that we thought, you know, in the Green Party would have always voted for the Greens because they were interested in, in natural medicine and so on, and they started to getting this thing about vaccines and anti-vax, and then went to, to extremist right-wing mm -hmm. movements, which, which was really an incredible journey. But because Facebook doesn't show them extremist right-wing content from the start because it would never work, mm -hmm. But they start with like, you like natural medicine and you get that kind of content and then you start getting, well, you're really sure about this vaccines, you know, and then it goes into anti-vax and so on. And they, they really send people on a journey, but it works so well, but they, because they know exactly where to start. Mm -hmm. What exactly, what kind of content will confirm your confirmation bias so you're likely to believe it. And then I start moving you step by step. And it's that's so scary, and this is yeah. what they do with the data, and this is well, why the data is so problematic. It's slightly more insidious than that, because it's not a question of they know where to start. It's a question of over and over again, it doesn't matter the context. It could be going from healthy recipes to eating disorders. It could be going from center left to far left. It could be center right to far right. It happens over and over again, and you're right. It pushes people towards extreme content because, as Mark Zuckerberg said himself in 2018, engagement-based ranking is dangerous because people are drawn to extreme content, even when they say they don't like it. And so I think the real thing that's, that's terrifying here is there's no, there's no man behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. It's just a hill climber. Algorithms are just hill climbers. And so it just keeps pushing us along and making us more and more extreme, making us question each other. And I think the thing that is so scary to me is the most vulnerable among us, so people who are recently widowed, recently divorced, moved to a new city, people who are isolated, end up getting shown the most misinformation, right? And that isolates them further. And like that estrangement is what breaks my heart. So if I was gonna uh, crystallize one single um, rule, I would say people are entitled to know is what's in the can what's on the label. Because right now what's on the label and what's in the can are not the same thing. And I think any laws from the DSA around transparency are so vitally needed because people right now can't make responsible choices for their families, for themselves, for their societies, because they don't know what's actually happening on Facebook. Because like you said, they're not doing what they're saying they're doing. But I think another question that is really important is also, that's what you touched also, Alexandra Gese, is um, Facebook is not complying with their own terms and conditions. Mm. And then I, we also have um, all these women, all other victims who say, okay, am I going to sue Facebook now? So how are we going to enforce, as give people you know, the power to enforce also their rights on these big mm. platforms? Well, I think on this one, um, we are making progress with the, with the DSA because we have this article on orders by, by courts, for example, that has to be, have to be complied with without undue delay. And I think their enforcement will be, will be strong. I believe this is something that also member states, governments really want. And I think the European Commission is really looking in that. So there, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that this is going to, to work, that illegal content will be t taken down a lot more quickly because Facebook is realizing this is serious. I, I hope so, you know, <laughs> but I, I feel um, I'm hopeful on this one. And then there's another article on notice and action, which really gives users the right um, to, to place complaints under terms and conditions, but also under, um, under the rules on illegal content, um, criminal law. Um, but also it gives users the right to complain if legal content has been taken down, because the other way around, it's true as well, like legal content, that is feminist content, maybe content on abortions and so on, gets taken down disproportionately as well, and that is a problem for women as well. Um, so we may have to make sure we have a good balance there, but also that Facebook really has to answer quickly when a complaint is placed, they have to react to it, and this is, this is in the DSA. Um. We in Germany have 
a legislation that is really, that the, with the NetsDG, we have a legislation that for a lot of people is really advanced, that where um, really the platforms are obliged to uh, delete certain content after a certain specific uh, time, after 24 hours, after seven days. And with Reset, with the organization Reset, we have made a study uh, this year also um, during the elections. And we have seen that they're not even, um, in a lot of cases, they don't even take down this illegal content, although they are obliged to do it. So my question was, when we saw this, um, we were really important. We thought, okay, um, what the German government is saying, okay, then you have to, if you, um, if you don't comply with the law, then you have to pay a fine. Is that something that Facebook is even considering? Are they afraid of users suing them? Are they afraid of, um, you know, governments? Um, finding them, or, and this is what it seems like to us, do they feel like they are above the law right now? Do you know what the amount of the fines is? Like, are they $5,000? Are they $15,000? Ah, $2 million. They're two mil So it's $2 million per incident or per, like, no, if we've it's, seen a pattern? No, it's like a systemic a pattern, yeah. um, violation. So $2 million, you know, if they're going to make $45 billion in the next year, you know, $2 million is a fraction of a fraction of a percent. And so I think it's one of these things where, you know, we have to think really hard about, like, you know, what is the scale of problem, like of, of fines that would happen that would actually have a dent? I find it really amazing that when the um, U.S. government fined Facebook in 2018, uh, what was it, 2019? 2019, five billion dollars. Five billion dollars, that's a lot of money. That's more money than a lot of the GDPs of some countries in the world. Uh, the stock price went up that day because the market had feared the fine would be bigger. And so it's one of these things where we're living in a very unique time. You know, when there's an oil spill, it doesn't make it harder for us to regulate the oil industry. But right now, Facebook's actions, their choices, are making it, they're degrading our democracies, they're making our societies more brittle, less resilient, and the time is running out. We need to act and have strong regulation soon because the actions of Facebook are making it actually harder for us to act on regulating Facebook. So we need to act now. I feel we still have so many questions, but I feel we are at, out of time now. I just want um, some closing remarks, like two sentences. Um, where do you see Facebook in five years, and will they have solved the issues we talked about today? To all of you, just a quick answer. Here, I'll let her go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, it depends on how quickly they manage to change the subject. If we keep on talking what the problems are and the reputation is being hurt, then that's the only thing that will make them change things. I think it's a reputation thing. It doesn't matter about money. It, it, even a fine that is one billion, 45 is way more. So um, I think it's about reputation. And a couple of years ago, all the young people kind of left Facebook or just kept their profiles but didn't really go online anymore. And one would think, mm, maybe, you know, the time's over and they need to do something new. But then they kind of managed to get all the old people in. <laughs> and so the platform changed with that as well. And so we need to see what kind of change they make now. But I think it's about reputation. A brief answer, because Sorry. we're really running out of time. Alexander Giesen. Well, I think it depends a lot on whether we are successful with achieving a very ambitious DSA. If we manage that, I think we can set a new standard and social networks will have to decide whether they want to continue to exist within those boundaries and really um, cater to the needs of their users and make money in the meantime, or whether they want to keep breaking the law and then the DSA has the possibility uh, to introduce structural changes, which mean, might mean breaking Facebook up or in the worst case, shutting them down in Europe. There will be space for new social networks. Francis. Um, as someone who worked on Google Plus back in the day, people make fun of it, but you know, it was actually, it had many, many pluses. Um, you know, we can build new social networks. And one of the things when you say, like, you know, shutting down Facebook in Europe, you know, building social networks that are democratic, that are based on democratic principles is a real thing. My hope is that we can do the right reforms for Facebook and that Facebook will step up and take responsibility. And I think that will make them more profitable in five years or 10 years, right? Because right now they're making very short-term decisions and we can help them make long-term decisions. So I'm hopeful of the DSA and that we can move forward. Thank you very much. It has been a real pleasure. And I think after what we've learned today, um, it is very clear that this is our ultimate wake-up call. You, um, you framed it for politicians, for societies to act. 
And I think we need, what we've learned today is that we need to find just but systemic solutions to protect those who are most vulnerable, like, for example, young girls and women, and to protect our democratic societies. And I think it is also very clear that it is on us now to make sure that these platforms become safe, public spaces, and I think we need to act now. Thank you very much, and good evening. Thank you.